welcome everybody that's virtual. Welcome to those of you that are sitting here. Um, love y'all. I love seeing your faces. I love seeing you respond to God's word, whether it's spoken or sung. Um, what a time of worship already. So what were you doing in May of 2019? That's where we're going to start. What were you doing in May of 2019? For us here at Waterstone, we were just starting a series called The Prison Epistles. We went through Colossians and Philemon and Ephesians, and today we close out the book of Philippians, or as some say, Philippians. We finish it up today. So it's been a long haul. Uh, we've gone verse by verse, uh, which we love doing, to see what God has for us in his word. So we'll finish up Philippians today. Um, we'll be in the last 10 verses of Philippians chapter 4. And then next week, uh, a preamble. You need to come back. Next week, we start the book of Daniel. What an amazing book, how appropriate it is for today, for what we're living through. Um, Daniel, just amazing stuff about God's sovereignty, despite what bad things might be going on in your life, in the life of the nation that you happen to live in, or the life of the nation that you happen to be taken captive into, as the case may be. God's hand is still active and moving. Um, there's hope for us in the book of Daniel. There's warning for us in the book of Daniel. There's encouragement for us in the book of Daniel. So come back. Have no idea how long we'll be in the book of Daniel. It'll be what it'll be, but we start next week the book of Daniel. But this week we're finishing um, the book of Philippians. So let's pray and dive into the Word. Lord, thank you for the worship already this morning. Thank you for touching my heart, drawing me into your throne room, leading me into worship. Lord, I love seeing you high and lifted up. I love seeing you exalted. And I love the truth of your word that when that happens, you draw us into your presence. God, do that as we open up your word this morning. I pray that like the guys on the road to Emmaus, that our ears and our hearts would burn at your word. Lord, by your spirit, teach and move and convict and encourage all the things that need to happen, Lord, for the folks in this room and the folks that are watching. Do what only you can do, Lord. Touch hearts right where people are at. Touch them, draw them, Lord, I pray that your word would encourage us today, strengthen us today, give us a hope and a purpose that's fresh. Lord, we are desperate to be touched by you. Even, Lord, if we're sitting here and we don't sense that we're desperate to be touched by you, it's all the more real that we are desperate to be touched by you. This life is hopeless and meaningless apart from you. Lord, I beg you to touch us. Touch me. Touch my brothers and sisters. Touch those that are lost if some, some folks are watching or are here listening that are lost. Lord, this is so that you may be glorified today. That's our desire. And we praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you would, if you're able. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And, to my, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
be with your spirit. Thank you. Be seated. Oh, such rich, richness just in the last few verses. Philippians has been an amazing book. Um, so a couple of things. Well, we're going to start with just the key words. So walk with me through some of the key words, if you would. And for you, there may be other key words. That's cool. That's the amazing thing about our God. He can show. It's like looking into this, the biggest diamond ever. And everywhere you turn it, there's something different to be seen. Some, some speck, some flash, something different. And, and that's his word. We turn it and we look at it and he ministers to us individually. But for me, I'm going to talk through the key words that I, I saw. Verse 14, share. Verse 15, partnership, giving, receiving. Verse 16, sent to me, sent me help. Verse 17, gift, fruit, increasing to your credit. Verse 18, full payment, gifts, fragrant offering, sacrifice. You notice a theme there. Paul, Paul shifts from last week um, when we heard about, about Paul saying, let's, let's just quickly go back to verse 10 for the context. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at length, you have re- revived my concerns, revived your concerns for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. If Paul had learned a secret, you think it's important for you? (coughs) It is for me. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. The secret that he learned was the last verse there that Ron taught on last week. I can do what? All things through him who strengthens me. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean you can go out and pluck up that oak tree outside and toss it across the street. That's all things, right? But that's not the context. The context is when God calls you to do something, it doesn't matter what challenges or benefits come your way. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He is there. He would never call you to do something and not give you the ability and strength to do it. We tend to look at what's going on right around us. Paul is in jail for the gospel. He did nothing. Not only did he do nothing wrong, he did everything right. He's going, I wish I had a map. He's going through Asia, east to west. And he's ministering to the churches. And he wants to go north into what today is northern part of Turkey, Istanbul area. That's where he wants to go. And the Holy Spirit does what? Forbids him. Forbids him to go speak the gospel to a lost group of people. Why would God do that? He wouldn't do that, would he? He had somebody else to go to Istanbul. Now, it wasn't Paul. It's not that God didn't care for those people. It's that that wasn't what he was calling Paul to. He wasn't calling Paul to go north. He was calling Paul to go west. And he gave Paul a dream. A guy from Macedonia saying, I need you to come help. And he was convinced that was from God. And they go. And they hit Philippi. And they find some ladies praying by the river. And what was the end result of that trip west to Philippi? I believe I'm a result of that trip west to Philippi. God knew that the ministry needed to head that direction. He had somebody else to go north. He had somebody else to go south into Africa. He had somebody else to go east into India and further. He had people to do the work. Paul's job wasn't that. Paul's job was to head the other direction. God knew what he was doing. So that's the context. And then Paul shifts gears from saying, I can do all things through him, through all the stuff that I'm enduring, I can endure because he gives me the strength. He goes from that to the next verse by saying, hey, here's the prisoner commending the free for what they're doing. He turns the focus on the Philippians, not himself, not his position, not even doctrine at this point, although for us, this is doctrine. 
all of a sudden he says, what you're doing, your kindness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for giving to me over the years. Thank you for participating with me. Thank you for sending Epaphroditus with gifts. Thank you for all these things that you have done. Praying for me there at Philippi, joining in my suffering as I go through Thessalonica. No suffering that we know of in Berea, but there probably was, and it just wasn't documented in the Word, but for sure in Thessalonica. He left Philippi, went to Thessalonica, and all of a sudden God's busting out. And when God busts out, what does Satan do? Uh Uh-oh, I got to catch up. So Satan gets these rabbles and starts causing problems for Paul, and, and Paul ends up moving and heading on in the ministry. And, and they got to Berea, and the Bereans, the Bereans were like, this is what we need to be like. You said that, Bob? Ron? Charles? Eh? Does it match with the rest of the word? Y'all need to be doing that. You, not need, you need to not listen to what I say or anybody else says and take it at face value. If it doesn't align with the word, you drop it. You don't listen. If it aligns with the word, well, that's the Bereans. It aligned, they were checking. They were checking out what Paul said and seeing if it aligned with the word. The, the people in Thessalonica heard about it. They sent the rabble from Thessalonica to Berea to cause more problems for Paul. This is a guy who did exactly what God wanted him to do, and everywhere he went, there was trouble. There was persecution. There was imprisonment. There were beatings. There were shipwrecks. That's Paul. And Paul says... You people at Philippi, thank you for being part of that. Thank you for coming to my aid. Thank you for sending me gifts. Thank you for participating with me in the work of what? The gospel. How do I know that? We'll get to the verse in just a second. The context for the for the people at Philippi. Not just Philippi, but that region. It's called Macedonia. Flip with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Charles actually tied these verses into this. Charles, we need to pray for his voice. It's his livelihood, and it's our benefit for his voice to be good. So be praying for Charles. Um, Charles was preparing for the closeout of Philippians, um, and he sent me his notes, and I, I captured some of them, brother. Some of them, I, I went where I thought God was calling me. These verses, I hadn't tied to, to these folks in Philippi. So important context about what these folks were enduring. Second Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Is that your heart? So in the midst of severe trial and suffering and poverty, the church at Philippi, as part of the Macedonian churches, supported Paul's work in the gospel. We rightly, we honor self-sacrificing service for the benefit of others. Think of first responders. Thank you for your career of law enforcement, Alex, and others, whether it's law enforcement, fire department, First responders, healthcare workers. We have healthcare workers in our midst here. Thank you. We as a society look at those who put themselves in danger, who run. I thought about those of you that know me. We had Ann and I had COVID a while back, um, sitting in the room waiting to be tested. My thought for the nurse and the doctor was they're putting themselves at risk, knowing. Assuming that I have COVID, after the test comes back positive, knowing that I had COVID, to come back in and talk to me about what I should do. They put themselves at risk. We, there is something unique and special about that. 
teachers who knowingly put themselves out for the sake of the kids. The list goes on and on. We honor that kind of behavior. And I believe the reason we honor that kind of behavior is because it models God's behavior. John 3, 16. All these words for gave in Philippians chapter 4, the, the root Greek word is in the verses that I'm going to give you. John 3, 16. Who can quote it for me? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only son. That who, who, Wayne? Whosoever believes in him would have everlasting life. He gave his son because he loved me. A jacked up guy like Bob, he loved me and he gave his son for me. And then a verse that we talked about a little while ago, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. He didn't come to serve. Here's the king of all. Didn't come to serve, to be served, but he came to serve and to give, same Greek word his life a ransom for many. That's his heart. His heart is to give. And in the context of Philippians, flip back with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter one. I had the distinct honor of preaching through these verses. And I learned, God showed me so much walking through these verses. Philippians chapter two, starting in verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the God that we serve, a God who saw the need, emptied himself, took on the form of what was needed, and died on our behalf. There is no greater example. I love healthcare workers. I love first responders who run up stairwells when the upper floors are on fire while everybody else is trying to get out of the building. They're going to do their job. I honor and respect that, but that kind of behavior doesn't compare with what God did for us in Christ Jesus. Doesn't compare. It's in a league of its own what he did for us. But here, Paul is saying back in Philippians chapter 4, thank you for sharing in my need. Thank you for sharing in my ministry. Thank you for sharing in the call that Paul had from God. So what about you? A few weeks from now, Nancy, we're going to put you on the spot. We're going to ask you to tell us what is the vision for right down the street with the apartments. What's the vision for that? How will we reach a group of folks in the apartment and kids in the apartment, single parents in the apartment that are in need of Christ, in need of the gospel? How do we get out of our comfort zone and start ministering? I'm, here's my request for you. Start praying about it now. I want you to think of yourself as a Philippian resident, and I want you to think of Nancy as Paul. How can I support the work that God has called her to. How can I be a part of that? How can I come alongside? How can I give? How can I support? That's one thing. I've talked to y'all, um, some of you anyway, about a book I read. I, I recommend it, but I recommend you read this book from a Christian perspective. That's not how it was written. It was written from a combat and a business perspective, but I encourage you to read it from a Christian perspective. It's called Extreme Ownership, and it's, it was written by two Navy SEALs, um, and, it's, and it's all about taking responsibility for the, the stuff that's around you. Don't blame other people for how it's going. Take responsibility for it. Do something about it. Well, they, they did a thing, and this is what I've mentioned to some of y'all before. It's called COP. It was, in, it, it was primarily lessons learned from a battle in Iraq. And in that battle, huge opposition forces in the city, and, and these the American forces coalition actually chose to set up these cops. So they would go into a really rough neighborhood. They would pick the roughest neighborhoods and go into the roughest neighborhood and take over a building and call that building their cop, their combat outpost. That building is surrounded by hostiles. They're by themselves, but they start going out on patrols and 
pushing goodness out into the neighborhood of the roughest neighborhoods. I encourage you, I encourage you to view your home as a cop. Come up with a different, the acronym that I came up with was SOI, sphere of influence. My home is my sphere of influence. I know my neighbor straight across the street and what their needs are. I encourage him. I speak the truth to him. His neighbor, I know him and the challenges that they're having as a family. I have the ability to speak the truth to him, to encourage him. The folks on the other side of my neighbor across the street, I know them and the challenges they have. The folks on either side of my house, I know them and the challenges that they have. God has put me in a home with neighbors for a reason. It's not an accident. It's my sphere of influence. My family is my sphere of influence. My friends, my sphere of influence. I did some research. If you can choose research, I love research. But research can be jacked up. Sometimes it can be accurate. So take this with a grain of salt. How many people does the average American run into each day outside of their normal sphere of influence? The answer is 20. It's lower if you're really young, and it's slower if you're really old. The lowest age is actually 85, if you can trust the statistics. And then it goes back up, probably because you're now not living at your house anymore. You're 90, and you're going to live with an assisted living facility where you're eating dinner with other people. And so that, I'm guessing that's what it is. But it, it's about 20. That's my sphere of influence. God brings me across in the natural course of me living my life, not in quarantine. He brings me across 20 people a day. A chance for me to be salt and light for a world that's lost and desperate for him and doesn't even know it. Am I doing that? Are you doing that with your sphere of influence? Don't answer this, Jacob, and I'm not going to give you a dollar or Nathan or Amy or Eric. If you ask my kids, is your dad really a Christian? Does he walk right? I'm not going to say what you would say because it's yours to say. But what if somebody asked your, your family, what are they really like when nobody's around? What are they like? Are they examples of Christ? That's where the rubber meets the road. Your sphere of influence, are you being what God's called you to be? Our sphere of influence in this building, I wanted to do research and I just never got to it. How many homes are in our area? In a two mile radius, a bunch. Apartments, a bunch. Law enforcement, fire department, a bunch. What are we do? What are you, not we, what is Waterstone doing? That's not the question. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing with the sphere of influence God has given you responsibility for? You're going to answer to that one day. The leaders at Waterstone are going to answer for Waterstone. You're going to answer for you. What are you doing? And God, what do you want? Lord, I think I need to go north. No, Bob, you need to go west. Did I go west? If west is knocking on doors of strangers, did I go west and knock on the doors of strangers? If going west is ministering to the lady at Publix that's cashing me out, did I minister to her? The waitress, when we go to lunch, the waiter, when you go, pick the person. Are you being obedient? We as Waterstone, we are going to consciously invest in the apartment building down the street from us and see what God does. Let me tell you what it's not for. It's not for getting more people in here. It's getting more people in his kingdom. It's in touching hearts. It's in pointing people to Christ. I don't care where they go to church. I don't care where you go to church. The point is, is their heart after Christ? That's what counts. Because the day's gonna come when I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to answer for the sphere of influence that my life has, will he have found me faithful when that day comes? And will he have found you faithful when that day comes? Whatever it is for you personally, get at it. And what's the promise? Hey, Philippians, and we saw in 2 Corinthians how their challenge and poverty 
was the frame that they gave, and they gave anyway. And God's, God's take of that. Verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. God looks at what we do as fruit. Our obedience as fruit. And he stores up. That, that term credit there is an accounting term. He stores up. He remembers what I do, and he stores it up as credit for me. The things I don't do, I'm going to have to pay for that, but praise God, his blood is sufficient. It doesn't give me an excuse to sin, but his grace is still mine. Verse 18. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. These gifts in God's economy are a fragrant offering, a sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. The Philippians, out of their extreme hardship and poverty, gave to the work of the gospel. God countered it towards their credit, and he, he accepted that, not, not as a gift to Paul, which it was, and Paul is thanking them, but on a bigger, grander scale, God saw that as a sweet aroma in his nostrils, a sacrifice that the Philippians made that was pleasing and acceptable to God. Paul thanked them. If Paul had never thanked them, it's still true. God saw God was pleased with what they did. So you, he's calling me to do this, Bob. I'm scared. He's calling me to do this, Bob. I don't have enough money to do what he's calling me to do. He's calling me to do this, Bob. I don't have the time. I've got to stop something. Whatever your excuse is, and I I mean that in the nicest way, but it's still an excuse. If he calls you to do something, you better be doing it. So whatever, whatever Satan will put in your head as a hindrance from you being able to be obedient, here's the promise. And remember, Paul is talking to the Philippians that we have evidence from 2 Corinthians that they were doing all this awesome stuff from extreme poverty and hardship. It wasn't convenient for them. It wasn't easy. It was terrifying. It had to be terrifying for Epaphroditus to leave home in Philippi and travel on a multi-day perilous journey to go to Rome, not knowing what he's going to find when he goes to Paul. Are they going to imprison me too? I love the same Jesus that Paul loved. Am I going to be jailed? Am I never going to see my family again? Will I ever get back to Philippi? Epaphroditus went anyway, and he gave Paul the gifts from Philippi, and he got sick even to the point of death. And God had mercy on Paul and healed Epaphroditus. This same Epaphroditus, Paul talks about, hey, I I know that he brought the gift. So verse 19, and my God, through all of that, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So you're afraid to help Nancy and the team minister to the apartments? My God will supply every one of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We don't have enough money to do that. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. How much riches does God have? All of it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills according to scripture. And if you just extrapolate that out, he owns every one of those hills on every continent, on every planet, on every galaxy, in every universe. Everything is his. And if he calls you to do something, he will give you what you need from his riches in glory in Christ Jesus to accomplish the work that he has called you to do. There is not one excuse for your disobedience or my disobedience. Not one that holds a candle. It all pales because he's already promised, I'll give you everything you need to be obedient to me. Look, it's right here. And the context is people that had nothing, poverty, anguish, pain, 
and they gave to the gospel anyway. And Paul encourages them by saying, God's got you. It's not just words. He's got you. So that's God's view. What's the end result? (laughs) Man, I love this end result. We're going to start with verse 20 and 23. The end result is, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Whatever you do, it's for his glory. It's not for you. It's not for you to be thanked by Paul for what you did, you know, get a pat on the back. That's not what it's about. What it's about is that he receives glory. And verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with your spirit. It's for his glory and your benefit, that he would be glorified and that my spirit would be encouraged by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else is it about? It's the tweener verses. Verse 21 and 22, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. So here Paul is saying, all the, all the saints in Philippi, greet them. Tell them I said hello. Tell them I'm okay. Tell them whatever, just greet them. And then the brothers who are with me greet you. Would there have been one brother with Paul without God using the churches in Macedonia to support the work? God can do whatever he chooses to do. He chose to use the saints in Macedonia to support the work that Paul had. And by supporting that work, people got saved. And the brothers that are with Paul greet you, Philippi. So let me ask, I thought about uh, grabbing the verse and reading it. I'm just going to paraphrase it. There are those who plant. There are those who water. And there are those who get to watch the harvest. They get to reap. You're probably predominantly one of those three. Maybe you're a planter. Maybe you're a waterer. Maybe you have the benefit of watching somebody come to Christ. That's a special time. Anything that happens when the angels who stand in front of God view whatever is happening on this earth as something that they shout, they just break out in rejoicing over, then that's something we ought to pay attention to, and that's the salvation of of a lost human being. The angels rejoice over each one individually. That third one doesn't happen for me very often. I've known brothers that it's like at every turn, they're watching somebody get saved. And I, I would love for that to happen to me. God, you're in control. I'm predominantly a water, a planter and a water. Predominantly, if I had to pick one, I'd say I'm a waterer. But here's the scoop for that verse. They all three receive the same reward. God's got a purpose for us. If your purpose is to be a planter, then get planting. If your purpose is to be a waterer, then get watering. If your purpose is to see the harvest, get out there and see the harvest. The reward is is the same because it's all about kingdom business planting kingdom job watering kingdom job harvest kingdom job and here's a scoop of all those people can be out there watering on their own strength they can be out there planting on their own strength and be missing it the harvest is all his (laughs) ain't nothing i can do to bring a harvest. That is his work on the heart of an individual that leads them to the place where they say, I am hopeless and desperate without the blood of Christ covering my sins. I need to be redeemed. I can't do it myself. I need a redeemer. Christ did that for me. Lord, I can't believe you love me like that. That's the harvest. And that is the work of no person. That's the work of the spirit. Nothing else. And then the last part, verse 22. Not only do all the brothers with me greet you, but all the saints greet you, especially those of the household of Caesar. 
Are you kidding me? Here's Paul in Asia. He wants to go north. God stops him. He wants to do something else. God stop. So the Holy Spirit stops him once. The Spirit of Christ stops him another time. And then he has a dream about Macedonia and heading west. Did Paul have a clue that God would use him to touch the household of the person who ruled the world at that time? There was no one more powerful at that time than Caesar, human terms. Paul didn't have a clue when he was put in jail in Philippi. God's going to bust me out of this prison. The jailer is going to get saved. His family is going to get saved. They're all going to get baptized tonight. Paul didn't know that. Paul didn't know he was going to get in trouble in Thessalonia. Paul didn't know he was going to go to Berea. Paul didn't know he was going to go to Corinth. Paul didn't know he was going to be eventually put in jail and sent to Rome. And that by being sent to Rome, imprisoned, chained to guards, God was going to use Paul to save the household of Caesar. Paul didn't know that. But all along this path, Paul was faithful. Shipwreck, God, you got me. Bit by a serpent, God, you got me. Beaten, God, you got a purpose for my life. I'm going to be faithful. Imprisoned? I love the adage. You know, it, it, it's a testament to our country, true. But you can't let it just be a testament to our country. Prayer removed from the schools. No, it's not. You can't stop prayer. Imprisoned? Can't stop prayer. Can't stop worship. Here's Paul and Silas singing in the prison at midnight. God sends an earthquake, opens up the doors. You can't stop God. Nothing, nothing can stop his kingdom work. And he calls us to just take the next step. I don't want you to go north. I want you to go west, Paul. Take a step, Paul. Go west. You have no idea what I'm going to do, Paul. You have no idea what you're facing what bad things are coming your way, Paul, take another step. You can do all things through me. I strengthen you. Let me be glorified in your life. Let me be glorified in your death. Everything about Bob, I pray that God would be glorified. There's stuff I don't want to endure. But am I willing to endure it if it means the household of Caesar is going to know the blessing of the blood of Christ. Am I willing? Are you willing? That's the question today. Are you willing to do what he's calling you to do? To get involved, to say, I don't understand. That's where I think I need to go, but you keep moving me over here. Just take the step where he's leading you. Are you willing? The end result is he gets all the glory and the praise. It's do him anyway. But along that path, he will show you, he, he will give you the ability to stand, to endure, to press through, to persevere in spite of what you can see. Last verse, Philippians chapter one. Verse six. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it, bring it to completion when? In the day, the day of Christ Jesus. There is a day coming when all will be accounted for, where all the injustices will be made right, where all the pain will be healed, all the tears will be wiped away. There is a day coming when that will happen. Stand in that fact. Don't forget that there is a hope on the other side of whatever you're going through. And that while you're going through it, he has a job for you. He has a job for me. I need to be at it, and so do you. Let's pray. Lord, I praise you for the example of the Philippians, of the brothers and sisters in Macedonia who under severe hardship and poverty chose to give themselves to you first and then to the work. They sent gifts, they sent money, 
They sent material for needs. They sent their brothers and sisters. And Lord, your word says that Paul was ministered to, that the work increased, that you were glorified, that you gave strength for the path. Lord, help us to live like that. Help us to be focused out and up instead of in and down. Lord, if anyone is not saved, I pray that you would draw them to the cross. Pray that you would convince them of their sin and convince them that you paid the price for their behalf. Your love was that great. And Lord, for those of us who are saved, I pray that we'd get busy. I pray that we would sense that the time is short, the need is desperate, darkness is closing in, but that you've made us the light and the salt for a world that's dying around us. God, give us creativity in sharing your word. Give us boldness to share your word. Give us an unction to share your word, to share your love. But more than anything, Lord, I pray that your spirit would be strong through us, that you would go forth through us, that it wouldn't be by anything that we do, our power, our creativity, but that it that we would be used by you in the power of your spirit for your glory and your fame and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen.